Hi everyone, my name is Mark and I work in the Schools and Colleges Liaison Team at Kingston University and my job essentially is to design and deliver presentations and workshops all about things to do uh, with higher education and you can see there on the screen that today's session, this session is going to be about student finance. Um, but before I get into that, just a bit of uh, a background. So um, I've, I've worked at Kingston University for quite a few years now, and I've worked with Carl Schulten High School for Girls um, for, for many of those. And I was due to, to come in and visit you um, next week, but unfortunately, but understandably, due to kind of concerns and uncertainty, uncertainty surrounding uh, COVID still, um, I understand that it's all going online, um, so hence this online presentation rather than a physical presentation. Um, but I was thinking about it and I, I think actually there's a bit of a silver lining here, especially when it comes to a topic like student finance, which can uh, it can get, be quite complicated, can be quite detailed um, and, and in an in-person presentation, obviously I've got a set amount of time, usually anywhere between you know 15-20 minutes and a full hour, um, but if it's the shorter time slot that I'm given, then I often have to skip through lots of detail and um, just whiz through things that I would otherwise like to take a, a bit more time going through so that by the end of the presentation, you as the audience have a good understanding or a basic understanding um, of, uh, of, of the topic. Um, so the silver lining with this being online and recorded is that hopefully if there's any sections you're not too sure about you can pause the video you can rewind it you can watch the whole thing again um, so in fact i'd like to think that it's not it's it's not intrinsically negative that it's it's virtual than uh, as opposed to in person um, and yeah like i said there are going to be points where there's quite a bit of information on screen there's perhaps suggested links that you can yet pause the video make a note of those whereas in person, that would be a, a bit more more challenging. Anyway, student finance explains. Let's let's make a start. So, a quick note: uh, due to um, devolution, there is variation across the four nations of the UK, and I don't want to bore you with the structure of the student loans company, but it's worth just mentioning how it works because you might, when you do your own research, and I understand it's parents and guardians and students that are watching this video, as you do your own research, you might see slightly different terms. So it's good to just know where things sit. So the student loans company is like, it's like the mothership. I describe it as the mothership. However, as a student, you probably won't have really any sort of dealings with them so much. Um, you will actually have dealings with your funding body and there are four funding bodies that exist student finance england um, student finance wales student finance northern ireland and then student awards agency scotland and i'm making a bit of an assumption here because i don't know exactly who my audience are but I, i'm i'm assuming that most of you or the students that uh, that are applying and thinking about going to university, you are what's called ordinarily resident in England. And as a result, Student Finance England will be your funding body. Um, I might interchange terminology um, with this. If I sometimes I might say student loans company, sometimes I might say Student Finance England. And in fact, I actually mean the latter. I mean Student Finance England or your respective um, funding body. So just just be, be aware of that there. Um, so the figures that I'm quoting are correct for 2022-23 entry. They were released at the end of last year, so they are up to date. And I assume this is a year 13 audience. Um, but if you are in year 12 or, or earlier, um, don't just switch off. You can you can take the figures that we, we see and, and you can just kind of um, use them as a, as a starting point. Often there's an inflationary rise every single year, so um, they won't be a million miles away. This presentation is not in, is in is in no way designed to sell, advocate, endorse, promote whatever word you want to use there. The current system. Um, that's not why I'm doing this presentation. That's not why I do my job. And certainly, Miss Bevan hasn't asked me to create this presentation um, with with any sort of agenda. Um, like I said, my job is to create presentations, deliver workshop, host um, campus visits, um, just to either start the conversation about whatever topic it is that I've been asked to cover, in this case student finance, or to continue the conversation if you've already um, started doing your own research. I, I don't have that agenda here. 
I simply want to make sure that everyone who's thinking about university, plus parents and guardians, um, those of you who are watching as, as well, um, because you are, you know, key players in, in, the, uh, in the equation, as we'll see later on, has a basic understanding of how student finance actually works. And we don't have the time during this presentation to go through the full eligibility criteria, and, and neither would we if we were doing this in person. Um, so this is perhaps something that I will have to leave to you to do, because it's a case of looking at your own individual circumstances and then applying them against the eligibility criteria. And for the full details, you've got the government website there on the screen, um, student finance, who qualifies. Perhaps, like I said, pause the video, make notes of that URL, um, because everything that we're going to talk about in this presentation is assuming that you have done that research and that you are eligible. Me talking to you about this doesn't mean that you're automatically eligible for student finance. You have to do that um, and make sure that you are, are, are checking the system there. So usually I'd ask my audience if they know who this man is and often quite a few people do do know who he is and if, if you're kind of saying it in your mind uh, as you're watching this presentation and you know that it's Martin Lewis kudos to you he uh, if, if you don't know um, he's the founder and chair of money saving expert Dot com. And the reason why I have put a picture of, of him on the screen now is for two reasons, actually. Um, one, actually, Money Saving Expert is probably the best place I would suggest anyone goes in relation to information, advice and guidance in relation to student finance. Really kind of well written articles, very comprehensive, good level of detail. And, and often I read an article and I'm, I'm left thinking, actually, you know what, I understand that. Whereas sometimes you can read articles, especially the, you know, the more official government ones that are very dry, a bit difficult to understand. You maybe have to read it multiple times to half get your head around it. That's not the case with Money Saving Expert. And we'll link back to uh, articles they've written uh, later in the presentation. But the second reason I've got a picture of Martin Lewis uh, on screen is I've, st I've stolen one of his quotes. Um, oh, my, my bubble there is uh, obscuring it a little bit there, but um, ignore everything that you've read in the papers, ignore the political spittle that fires across parliament. In some cases, ignore what parents tell you too. That's no dig at you, parents and guardians. It just, the system has changed a lot. Um, in the time that uh, you went to university, if, if, if that's what you did. Um, there are more myths and misunderstanding about student finance than any other subject. And that's absolutely true. Like I said, I do talks, workshops on all things related to higher education. Um, you know, what it means to go, go to university, choices, um, applications, personal statement writing, um, subject workshops, student finance. Student finance by far the one that people are just either don't know how it works and have got their head buried in the sand a little bit with it or what they do know isn't actually quite right um, because often with student finance um, what you read in the media it, it can be a little bit misleading um, and the great thing about doing these workshops is we get to kind of unpack that a little bit and be like, okay, that bit is not quite right. That's not how it works. Let's look at that and look at how it works so that hopefully by the end of the presentation, not only do you have a better understanding of student finance, uh, how student finance works, but it's correct and it's accurate. Anyway, so the cost of university, I'm going to uh, take the average student here. And um, I know individual circumstances differ but we're looking at the average student here and you can apply uh, what your circumstances is to that if you like. So the cost of university for most students going to university there are two main funding streams that they need to be mindful of. There's the tuition fee element and then there's the living cost and we're going to start initially with uh, tuition fee. This in my experience at least if students or, or prospective students and parents and guardians know anything about student finance 99% of the time it's about tuition fees because that's what gets all the political and all the media attention. Um, but actually, as we'll see, it's the living costs that one, people don't know that much about, if anything. And, and, but two, they, they actually should know more because that's what's going to um, affect them the most on a day-to-day -day basis as a student. So tuition fees, universities can now charge up to £9,250 um, per year for undergraduate courses slightly more there as you can see on screen for accelerated two-year degrees but they're quite quite few and far between there so for most people it's the 9250 there um this 9250 i wouldn't get too, too um worried about that uh, in the sense of 
um, th that that's the price tag of university. And as we'll see, as we go through this presentation, we'll unpack the information. There is a big difference between the price tag, the apparent price tag of university and what students actually end up paying. So that 9250 just kind of, I hate the phrase, but put a pin in it um, and, and you, it will make more sense later in the presentation. Eligible students will not have to pay their tuition fees up front. Um, it's paid on your behalf by your funding body and um, you don't pay it back until you have until you finished university and you have the means to actually make those contributions we'll talk about repayments later on both eligible full and part-time students can have their fees covered by what's called a tuition fee loan that's the that's the, the term there tuition fee loan it's non-means tested which means that providing that you fulfill the the, the main criteria eligibility criteria that we previously mentioned um, it doesn't take into a fact in, into account other factors about you and, and where you're studying um, and where you're living, which um, isn't the case for the living costs, but for tuition fees, which we're concentrating on now, um, it's non-means tested. So if, if you are eligible for it, you will have that 9250 covered in its entirety. And it sounds obvious to, to me, I, I went to university um, and, and perhaps any students that are currently at university, um, but you don't actually see this money. It doesn't get transferred from, say, Student Finance England's account to your account for you to then pay your university. That doesn't happen at all. It goes straight from your funding body, Student Finance England, I, I assume, um, straight to your respective university. It doesn't come via you. Um, foundation Diploma in Art and Design, I'll mention this very quickly because there's usually a couple of people in, in the audience that this is relevant for. The main thing with a Foundation Diploma in Art and Design is a bit of, there's a bit of confusion regarding the terminology and it's worth just ironing that out. The Foundation Diploma in Art and Design is its full and correct title. It is not, ladies and gents, a foundation year. Um, in art and design or a foundation degree in art and design. A foundation year and a foundation degree are completely separate standalone qualifications. They're not the same things. Because it's a foundation diploma in art and design, it is classed as a further education FE course, level three, same as an A, a level or, or BTEC or T level. Um, and because it's a level three, it's not eligible for funding via the student loans company. However, I'm always keen to highlight that a student under the age of 19, the 31st of August, the year of entry, will not be charged a tuition fee. Um, so it's just worth bearing that in mind. So we're back here. We've talked a little bit about tuition fee, um, but we'll, we'll switch the dial over now and we'll talk about living costs. And like I said before, it's one of those things where if any if, if someone knows something about student finance, nine times out of ten, it's about tuition fees. But as we've seen, you, you, you don't actually see that money. It's it's kind of a bit, bit nebula, if, if you like. Um, uh, but with the living costs, that is the thing that is going to if if it's if anything's going to trip you up it's going to be the living costs yet all of the attention is on tuition fees i, I hope I'm, I'm making sense with that one forgive me if not but here's the new term for you a maintenance loan so we had tuition fee loan now we've got a maintenance loan um, all eligible full and part-time students can apply for a loan to help cover their living cost and I'll usually if I was doing this um, lie you know in, in person I'd kind of ask my audience why do you think I've highlighted uh, or, or emphasized the words help cover and um, mo most people have an idea and yes because there's nothing in the in the small print and trust me I've checked that suggests or implies that a student's maintenance loan should cover everything that they need to pay for as a, a student and and just on this this topic, according to Save the Student, um, the full citation, if you like, is at the bottom of the screen. And I encourage you to check out the full report because it's very insightful. Um, Save the Student, much like a money saving expert, do some really informative articles. Um, Save the Student seem to do a, a bit more kind of survey based work. Um, and this is what I've pulled uh, out for this uh, presentation. So Save the Student um, uh, discovered um, that the average student is about £340 a month short. So this is between the money they receive from the government in terms of the maintenance loan and the money going out in terms of their living costs. Now, this isn't a budgeting presentation as such, but I thought, you know, I'm doing a recording. I've probably got a bit more time to, to talk. So let's maybe just go into this topic a little bit more. 
Um, so another another research, this actually came out at, at, at the end of last year, so hot off the press. So according to Unipol and the National Union of Students, the average student, for the average student, and again, we're, we're talking about the average here, um, rent alone consumes 88% of their maintenance loan in London and 72% of their maintenance loan outside of London. So again, I'm, I'm not... <sighs> I'm not saying this to spark fear into anyone or to put anyone off. Again, I don't have that agenda. My job really is just to say, hey, here are the facts. This is how it works. This is the reality for the average student going to university these days. And then you go away, you do your own research, you do your own calculations and see how that kind of then affects you. And again, this isn't about uh, a budgeting, but it, you know, we're, we're talking about accommodation and there's a few other things that it's always worth mentioning um, wh whenever you talk about accommodation and money in general. Um, private providers now dominate the student accommodation market. Around 70% of all student accommodation is through a private um, provider. Um, university owned accommodation is becoming less and less and the university accommodate owned accommodation that does exist, that kind of slightly older stock with stock with typically cheaper rents is becoming less and less uh, available um, simply because universities are seeing what is available in the private market and they're upgrading their stock to try and compete with that so um, as a result you know more and more students are kind of staying at home um, or wherever it is they're currently based in order to kind of ease pressures that we're talking about here but um, again this isn't a budgeting uh, presentation it's a, a student finance but it, it's worth just talking about this so that again you can do your own research the links at the bottom of the screen there so feel free to pause um, the, the title of the reports are there I'm sure if you just google those um, they will come out I encourage you to have a read um, because again it's just about knowing how it works and being able to um, you know be pre prepared um, you know for, for, for your time at university if this is the route you decide to go down um, so anyway, maintenance loan, paid at the start of each term directly into the student's bank account. Um, the amount received depends on a few factors. So unlike the tuition fee loan, remember that was non-means tested, that's not the case here with a maintenance loan. There's kind of three factors at play. There's the household or family income, that's the main one really, where in the UK you decide to study and if you move out of your parental home, those are the three variables there. And we'll look at some facts, uh, we'll look at some figures in a second. As a result, it was normal for everyone to receive a different amount because those variables are playing different parts in the background for, for everyone. You need to tell a student loans company or, or your, your funding body, Student Finance England, if there is a change to your circumstances because your figures might change, you might be eligible for more, you might be, uh, be receiving too much, that sort of thing. Um, and it's important to note you will not receive the first allocation of your maintenance loan until you're registered with your university as, as part of the enrolment. And the reason why I say this is because um, that might not be until the second, maybe if there's delays, third week of term in September. You know, worst case kind of say, case scenario, maybe even early October. And uh, so I'm sure you can imagine there will be initial there will be things that you need to pay for, maybe a deposit on accommodation, pots and pans, um, a, a few core textbooks or something like that. And you and students quite rightly think, oh, I'll use the first allocation of a maintenance loan to pay for those things. However, if you're not getting your first allocation of your maintenance loan until the second, third week of term, you might already ha need to have paid for those things. So I'm sure you get what I'm saying here. So we'll look at some figures here. Um, again, these are the figures that are correct for 2022-23 academic year. Um, so if a student is uh, living at their parental home, regardless of where that, that is, they could be eligible for up to £8,171 per academic year that's up to and there is a there is a range here there's a minimum amount uh, which is about half this and then that that's the maximum amount there the uh, if they're staying at their parental home if they move away from their parental home or they hold the student holds independent student status and the full details you can see at the bottom of the screen there so Pause the video. Um, it's quite a strict definition. The main one is if they are 25 or older or care for someone in, under the age of 18. It's quite, um, 
it's quite a strict kind of definition. It's not something that you can just kind of crowbar and then they'll be like, oh yeah, well, Kalashi was an independent student. Um, it is quite a strict definition there. But if, if you are a student, and you fulfill that criteria that make sure that that is um, that is present on your application because as you see you, you can be eligible for for more so away from home or hold independent student status it splits into two if it's if you're studying um, outside of greater london you could receive up to nine thousand seven hundred and six pounds per academic year remember that's up to um, and then inside, if you're studying inside Greater London, as you, as you can imagine, um, slightly higher living costs, that's reflected in the allocation. It could be up to £12,667 per academic year. And like I said, there's, there's a range. There's a range here. There's a minimum amount, which is roughly half the figures you see on screen. And then there's the maximum amount, which is the figures you can see on the screen. And most students um, will get somewhere in that range. And the reason why they get somewhere in that range is because of that first variable we mentioned in the previous uh, on the previous slide, the household income. And that leads me to quite a, I don't want to say controversial, but uh, certainly in that direction, this idea of, um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I've reordered my slides, so I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that. Um, Forgive me, I, uh, there was a slide that was hidden, um, so I had to pause for a second there, unhide it, and then recommence the, the video here. So um, we were here talking about the uh, upper and lower amounts, um, the potential controversial issue um, of the expected, where is it? There it is, expected parental contribution. Now, um, this is something that admittedly it, it is not being particularly forthcoming in official documentation surrounding student finance. And um, credit where credit's due, money saving experts have done a lot of work in relation to this and say, actually, you need to be more transparent about, about how this works. And the government have said that they will, moving forward, be more transparent and they, this will feature in the, in the literature. Um, but I don't think that usually would take, you know, that would take a few years to kind of filter through to, to publications and stuff like that. So it could be that those watching this, this could be the first time you've heard of, of this uh, notion of the expected parental contribution, or it's sometimes referred to as the assumed parental contribution. So rightly or wrongly, if you do not hold that independent student status that we previously mentioned, the amount that you will receive as the student in terms of your maintenance only is directly connected to your household income, i.e. what your parents or your, um, your guardians earn. I'm not here to get into the politics of that, whether it's right or wrong. I'm just here again to say, this is how it works. And again, credit where credit's due. Money Saving Expert do a really informative article on this called How Much the Government Expects Parents to Give Their Children While Studying at University for 2020-2021. Um, the article's a few years old now, um, I realize. But it's still a very good article and it talks about the the principles of it and there's an update at the end of the article i believe it is which which gives um, a link to the most recent figures but the the principle of it and the explanation is still valid because that hasn't changed in the last kind of two two or so years um i encourage every parent guardian watching this to, to check out that article and to understand how it works the the long and short of it if you like is if your household income is assessed a, a, as being lower then your uh your child will be eligible for the higher uh, maintenance loan amounts then the reverse is also true if your household income is assessed as being particularly high your child will then be eligible for the lower amounts of their maintenance um uh, loan that's that's the in a nutshell if you like but again i encourage you to to read the article and read other literature you know don't just stick with money saving expert there are other um articles and websites that exist in relation to this um do your research just understand how it works that's that's my my kind of um my plea if you like um what if your income is dropped as a result of covid19 um there is advice on the government website in relation to this so if that applies to you i encourage you again pause the video maybe make a note of that url there on screen and have a read of it there 
There are additional forms of financial support available that exist in addition to what we've talked about already, namely the tuition fee loan and the maintenance loan. I'm going to put them all on the screen now. Um, Again, I don't mean to make assumptions about my audience, but I, I literally don't know who, I can't see you, I don't know what's, um, what your backgrounds are. But if this is applicable to anyone um, in, the, in the audience, uh, if any of these are applicable, I think it would be most likely, um, just in my, history, in my experience at least, the Disabled Students Allowance or the DSA, a contributions towards the essential extra costs you might have as a direct result of a disability. If you think that might apply to you, please check out the full details on that URL that you can see on screen now. I know I keep saying this, feel free to pause the video, um, make a note of it uh, and, and, and have, a, have a read through it. Because if you are eligible for one of these, um, anything that is labelled as an allowance, a grant, a bursary, um, a scholarship, that sort of thing is money that is given to students there with no expectation that it has to be paid back. So it's essentially free money. Um, again, there's, uh, there's some information that I'll just put on screen and if this is relevant to you, you can pause it. Um, but there's a relatively new thing, as you can see on screen there, it's, uh, it came into effect of September 2020, NHS Learning Support Fund, new and continuing degree level nursing midwifery and many allied healthcare students, including paramedic science, but not pharmacy, um, will benefit from additional support through the NHS Learning Support Fund. This effectively kind of um, replaces the NHS bursary, which, um, which was got rid of 2017, I think it was. And um, so this effectively replaces that, um, but works differently to how the bursary works. So there is a distinction there. It's not a like for like replacement, but if this, if you think this applies to you, again, pause the video, uh, the details are at the bottom of the screen there. So back here, we've talked about the tuition fee loan. We've talked about the maintenance loan. It's worth pointing out at this point, yes, you could go to university um, with both of those. That's what I did. I, I applied for both. You could go to university and you could apply for one or the other, or you could go to university and completely self-fund and, and not do any of this at all. Um, but again, we're talking about the average student here and the average student does take both and those go together to form your student loan. Um, I think I'm right in saying this is probably the first time in this presentation that I've used the term student loan and that's deliberately because there is no such thing technically as a student loan. You don't apply for a student loan, you apply for a tuition fee loan and or a maintenance loan. But the, for the purposes of repayment, um, it's easier just to say student loan. Those two figures, if you do get those two loans, they are, those are um, lumped together and they form your student loan and, and you chip away at that one figure. One is not given priority over the other, they're lumped together. So repayments, um, you will only start repaying your student loan when two things happen. The first is when you're earning over a certain threshold before tax and that currently stands at £27,295 per year. Again, excuse me, before tax and any other um, deductions. That's what it currently stands at as, as, as well. It's usually reviewed every year, usually around April, the kind of new tax year. Um, you know, so th let's be realistic about it. You're in year 13 now. Um, you, you might go to university in September or the year after if you defer or the year after that or, or whatever. Um, so you you're, you're probably won't be earning for, for until at the earliest, you know, another three or four years. And in that time, there'll be probably three or four reviews of that figure. So that's what it currently stands at. By the, but by the time you actually come to make your repayments, um, I'm not a betting man, but I would put money on the fact that that figure will have gone up and probably quite a few times in, in that period. Anyway, I, dig I digress. Um, and it kicks in the April after you graduate or you leave university. So usually there's a bit of a delay. People usually graduate kind of in the, in the summer. And then there's that delay. So for instance, I graduated in May 2011 and my student loan repayments didn't kick in um, until uh, the April 2012. So that's that, there's that lag if you like. Repayments are always dependent on your income. We'll look at some figures in a second to put it into perspective. Deducted automatically uh, by HMRC through your pay. Obviously if you're self-employed you are still responsible for your student loan repayments. You just do a go about it in a slightly different way with your um, tax assessments. I, I'm not an expert, um, but that's how it's done. Monthly repayments are not affected by the amount you've 
borrowed again when we look at the figures that might make a bit more sense having student loan will not affect your credit rating your liability is not passed on to someone else if you if you if you die it sounds very morbid and i usually get a few uh, you know looks uh, in my audience but it's worth mentioning that because that is the reality for some private loans and probably the most um the golden nugget piece of information in, the, in this entire presentation obviously i hope that this this entire presentation is informative but if you remember one thing from this presentation please let it be this after 30 years any outstanding repayments will be written off and this has led a lot of people myself including dare i inject a bit of personal opinion into the presentation um to believe that most students going to university these days, unless you go into a very high earning profession after university, will not actually clear their student loan within that 30 year term. And here's one example you can see on screen here, the Institute of Fiscal Studies estimated that 83% of English students will not clear their student loan within that 30 year term. And we're gonna come back to this. Um, we're gonna come back to this very point very soon. So repayment examples, I don't wanna turn this into a maths lesson, but it's worth just mentioning how it all works. Um, so your repayment rate is 9% of earnings above £27,295, that previously mentioned threshold. Obviously, it goes without saying, but it is worth mentioning that, yes, this is how it works now. Um, things can change. Um, but this is how it works now and this is this is the most up-to-date information that i can i can give you again um you are you know year 13 students or maybe year 12 you are three four five years off um being eligible of repaying your student loan it, it could change in that time but this is how it works now so here's a few figures um, if you earn £27,295 on the nose um, before tax and any other de deductions um you're not you're not eligible for paying anything back can you make voluntary overpayments yes you can could you pay it all off if you won the lottery for instance yes you can and you can do so without penalty which again isn't the case for other private loans or mortgages and things like that you you normally get an early repayment fine or fee or um, something like that it's when you go uh, but anyway going back to the repayments it, when you go a few full pound over the 27295 that's when your your eligibility kicks in so for instance, if we take that next example, £30,000, if you're on a salary of £30,000 before tax and any other deductions, you will be responsible for repaying £20 a month of your student loan. Now, usually, again, OK, this is probably the, the, the negative of, of an online presentation is I can't see my audience. But usually the reaction is that that, that is less, that's not as high as, as what people would have um, uh, predicted um, if I'd asked that question before revealing the figures and the reason for that is you're not you're not paying 9% on, the, on your full salary of £30,000 you're paying 9% of whatever your salary is above the threshold so in the £30,000 um, example you're not paying 9% on full £30,000 you're paying 9% on the amount above the threshold which is 2705 and then you, uh, whatever that is, uh, divide it by 12, and then that will give you your monthly um, repayment amount. And as you can see there, as your salary goes up, so do your so do your repayment contributions. If your salary goes down, so your repayment contributions. It's not a fixed amount, which again is usually a case with a mortgage or private um, or private loan. And if your, you know, if your salary doesn't go above that threshold of currently 27,295, then you're not responsible to pay. Um, and if you earn and then it, and then you maybe go part-time or you, you, you take a career break or whatever, again, as soon as it dips below that threshold, the repayments will automatically stop. Interest rates are charged on your student loan. Um, it, it does fluctuate. So best to look online to see what it is. It's usually the retail price index plus up to 3%. Um, and apply from the day the first payment is made to you or your university. But I usually breeze, breeze past that fact intentionally just because um, my, by most calculations, most people won't pay off their tu uh, tuition fee loan and their maintenance loan on their own. So the fact that interest is being applied to that only increases uh, the chances of not actually paying everything off in that 30 year term. So um, numbers on the screen are helpful, but I feel like we can go one better. And certainly this is how my mind works, at least being a bit more visual. Um, so hopefully this helps you as well. So imagine on the screen there, you can see there's a, a mortarboard graduation hats there on the left hand side that represents your um, your graduation um, 
or I should say the April after you graduate, because remember that's when it kicks in. There's usually that, that delay, that lag. The green tick just below me, where is it? There, um, that represents the 30 year timer that we previously mentioned, um, that if you get to that point, everything else is, that is outstanding is, is written off. So imagine you're fresh out of university, your first job after university, you're on a salary of 25,000 pounds before tax and any other deductions. Let's say, for instance, I know life is not this regimented, but bear with me. Um, imagine you do that job for 10 years. I usually ask my audience, how much would you repay your student loan? And most people think, look to each other and they think, oh, this is a bit of a trick question, isn't it? Um, no, it's not. The answer is zero. It's not above the repayment threshold. Could you make voluntary contributions? Yes, you can. But when we're going to assume that you don't do that in this scenario. OK, 10 years has passed. You get a promotion or another job or whatever. You are now on a salary of thirty five thousand pounds. You do that job for 10 years. How much would you be responsible for repaying? You could pause the video and, and do the calculation now if you want. And, and I'd be impressed if you if you do. Um, we know it's something. It's above the repayment threshold. So it's not like the previous 10 years. It is something. It's not going to be zero. What is it? It's £6,934. I stress that is within that entire 10 year period. That's not a year, a month or whatever. That's within that entire 10 year period. So it's 20 years after the April after you graduated, you're now on a, a, another job or a promotion or whatever. You're now on £45,000. You do that job for 10 years. You're getting the format here. Within that 10 year period, you would have paid back uh, £15,934. Ding, we are now at that 30 year timer. After 30 years, you would have paid off £22,868, or the equivalent of um, just shy of £800 a year. Now, I'm not going to insult anyone's, anyone's intelligence and, and, uh, and suggest that £22,000, £23,000 isn't a lot of money because it is, and there is a conversation to be have not ha had, not now, about whether university should cost at all. But that's not why I'm, I'm putting these figures on the screen here. If I'd asked people, if I had the ability to ask people, okay, how much does it cost an average student to go to university nowadays? Most people would say somewhere in the region of 50, 60,000 pounds a year. That, ladies and gents, is the apparent price tag. Remember, we mentioned this right at the beginning of the presentation, the price tag of university. What is more important and more significant and what you should concern yourself more with is actually how much are you going to pay back within that 30 year term? Like I said, some people will go to university and they will go on to higher earning jobs than the figures that we see on screen here. And yes, they might pay everything back that they borrowed in order to go to university. There is a conversation, not getting too political, uh, in relation to that and saying, well, maybe that's fair because arguably university provided them the stepping stone into that higher earning job. So they pay more back into the system as a result. Whether you think that's right or wrong, that's that's your that's your kind of, um, um, you know, um, thought process or, or whatever. But we've got to talk about the average student here. The average student going to university nowadays will not pay everything back within that 30 year term. And you can plug, plug whatever numbers you want into this into this equation. Imagine you're earning £20,000 after university. Will you pay anything back? No. £30,000? 2434 £40,000? 11434 Ding. Again, we're at that 30 year timer. Anything that is outstanding is written off, which means that after 30 years, you would have paid off 13800 and 68 and just for uh, just for you know for for the sheer hell of it um, let's just assume that for 30 years after the uh, the April after you graduate you earn 30,000 um, pounds you would have paid off after 30 years you would have paid off uh, 7,302 pounds per year again you can plug whatever numbers you want into the equation um, and, and come up with something a bit more tailored for you but you know, here's a few examples here. What I'm trying to say is that for most people, um, the amount that they borrow to go to university in terms of their tuition fee, their maintenance loan is different to what they will actually pay off within that 30 year term. And hopefully there's a few examples to illustrate the point. 
what if I move a border? You know, if uh, a common question that I do get asked, uh, the short answer is yes, you are still responsible for paying your student loan, even if you move abroad. Um, Save the student, again, kudos uh, and credit where credit's due. Save the student do a, a great article called Repaying Your Student Loan From Abroad. If you think you will be working overseas after university, I encourage you to check it out. And the good thing about this article is it actually has kind of equivalent salaries in different countries um, because it is 27,295 or whatever the threshold was or equivalent because obviously cost of living in different countries um, is either higher or lower. So that's a, quite a good article for that. Um, in a nutshell, if you're moving overseas for longer than three months, you will need to contact the student loans company or your funding body, Student Finance England, to sort out your student loan repayments. Um, you do this via what's called an overseas income assessment form, even if you won't be earning, perhaps you're volunteering or, or traveling or, or, or whatever. Um, this, yeah, like I said, check out that article from Save the Student. Details are at the bottom right hand side of the screen if you think that is applicable to you. Applying um, almost at the end now. Um, so we'll just cover the um, you know the, the the details a bit in relation to applying and and, and those um, formalities that's the word i was looking for um you must apply and reapply every academic year but 99 percent of the effort is done before first year um so don't think you need to do the income assessment every single year um most of that is done before your first year and then um it's just kind of rolled over in subsequent years um, normally after submitting your UCAS application, so I'm recording this on, I think it's the 5th of um, uh, January, so it hasn't up opened yet, student finance, it's usually late January or early February, so it hasn't launched yet, I'm keeping an eye on it. Um, but please don't think that UCAS and student finance are linked in any way. They're completely different organisations, completely different systems, completely different applications. Just because you've done your UCAS doesn't mean you've half done your student finance. They're different things, they're different things. Best ways to do it online, um, just make sure you're using uh, an official website there because there are private student loan providers. Uh, I think there's one called F uh, Future Finance or, or something like that. Just make sure you're applying through like a, an official um, link you don't need to wait until you have a confirmed place in order to apply i see this every single year i'll say to people have you applied for student finance have you applied for student finance have you applied for student finance and people say no because i haven't had all my responses from universities yet that doesn't matter you can make a start on your student finance application even before you have all of your replies from your universities in the first instance just to select your preferred choice on your student finance application this can always be changed later down the road no problem at all um, there's usually a deadline towards the end of May that hasn't been given yet, so the exact date is to be confirmed. Um, if you apply before that date, whenever it is on the end of May 2022, um, your funding body will guarantee your funding is ready by the time you start your course um, that September. Um, student loans company uh, say that they process 1.8 million applications per academic cycle and it takes at least six weeks um, but that's if there is absolutely nothing missing from your application so that's that's a, a best case scenario six weeks for most people it's slightly longer and um, for specific university bursaries uh, something that i've intentionally not covered in this presentation simply because that is a completely separate kind of rabbit hole to go down you'll need to apply directly to the respective universities and deadlines eligibility amounts things like that will differ from university to university to university so again something just to put on your list of things to do um, so summary, I realise that's quite a lot of information, but the great thing about this format is you can re-watch entire, you know, sections of this presentation or the entire thing if you like, um, if something didn't quite make sense. But the, the headlines, if you like, no tuition fees are paid up front by those who are eligible. And I stress you need to check the eligibility criteria and it, it it's normally di dictated by where you are considered ordinarily resident. Um, tuition fees are paid on your behalf by your funding body. You don't see that money. Remember, it doesn't get paid to you to pay your university. And there's lots of support available to help with living costs. That primarily comes in the form of a maintenance loan, although there are additional forms of financial support that we mentioned briefly. A level of support that you will receive will depend on your individual circumstances. 
Repayments are manageable and are only paid when you're earning over the current threshold, which is 20, currently 27,295 uh, before tax or any other deductions, um, completely wiped after 30 years. And I'll leave you with this, the apparent cost of university. And I say apparent intentionally because remember, there's a big difference between that price tag, the parent cost of university and what students will actually pay back within that 30 year term can be daunting. The apparent price tag at uh, the cost of university can be daunting, um, but do not let it be the sole reason why you might not go. And I've got a bit of a personal story to say in relation to this. Um, I actually delayed going to university for um, a couple of years before leaving sixth form and then going to university, mainly because I didn't know if it was the right thing for me. I had no idea how the money side of things worked. It was it seemed way too much of a risk to me. So um, it was something that I initially kind of uh, discounted. I thought that's not for me. Um, but I worked for two years and then I decided to go to university. And yes, would I love to go back and tell past Mark everything that I now know about student finance? Yes, I would. But can I? No, I can't. But what I can do is I can pass this information on to you as people kind of just thinking about university is it for me what, you know and this information will you know hopefully have paid a played a part in your decision making process um and yeah like i said i can't tell past mark these things but i can tell you so hopefully you have um found this useful again i encourage you to check out the links that we went we mentioned during this presentation go back watch sections again watch the whole thing again if you like um, um but yeah, hopefully you have an understanding, uh, a basic understanding of how, how student finance works. And, and when you do your own research, and I, I encourage you to continue your research, you'll see different terms and you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember Mark saying this, or I remember Mark mentioning that. I and mean, then it all just kind of fits into place. Anyway, I think I'll zip it for now. Um, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you've, you've, um, you, you've taken a lot away from this presentation. I certainly hope so. And I wish you the absolute best of luck um, with whatever your next step is.